But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. So we're looking at the who, the what, the when, the where, and the how. So we're going to look at the where. And this one's very important. The where is simple. It's at church. It's not at home. It's something that's done as a whole congregation. And there, there is heresies about this. He warned us about that. Look at verse number 18. First of all, when you are come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. For there must be heresies among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. When you come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. Now, on this verse here, there are others that point to this and say, see, we're not supposed to do it together. We don't come together as a church. And this is the verse that they will try to use to justify their stance. But what this verse does not say is don't do the, con the communion as a church. What it, it is not actually plainly stating what they claim that it says. Uh, what it's talking about is when you have a potluck, don't call that the Lord's Supper. And when you do have a potluck, you should share with each other. You should take care of each other. Let's read it again. He says, When you are come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. Right? The Lord's Supper is not an everyday thing. It was yearly. It was special. It was significant. It was a time of the year. You took things very serious and solemn, and you paid attention to what was going on. So if you're, if you're having a potluck, we were all at Brother Kyle's house earlier. Hey, well, hey, that, that was the Lord's Supper, wasn't it? We were all communing. No, it's not. That's what he's warning about here. And I know there are others that misuse this verse and say, see, we can't have it in the church. Well, that's not what the verse says. He's warning you about ordinance in the church, how we should keep order. Look what he says in 21. For in eating, everyone taketh before other his own supper, and one is hungry, and another is drunken. He's saying, you guys get together for a potluck, and you say, this potluck is really communion. And we're going to get together every week and have communion, and we're going to do it on our own terms. And I brought steak, and you got hot dogs, and I'm eating mine first, and I could care less if you're hungry. Right? He used those, those phrases at the end there, and he's talking about one is starving and one is full. You know? And it ought not to be that way. We ought to share. You know, we have potlucks every week in our church, and we will never call it communion. We will never say this is keeping the Lord's Supper, you know, because guess what? Sometimes there are people that leave the, all, leave the sanctuary right away and they make a beeline for the fellowship hall. They get over there and man, they're in the crock pot right away. They're just loading it up, right? And that's okay. That's all right. But you know what? Don't call that the Lord's Supper and don't be so rude to say, well, I got my food and I could care less about everybody else. Forget them. I got mine. And that was the problem with the Corinthians, and that's what he's warning against here. Look at verse 22. He says, What? Have ye not houses to eat and drink in? Or despise ye the church of God, and shame them that have not? What shall I say unto you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. You know, because you think about what he's saying here. Shaming somebody that has not. Now, what is communion? It's a small piece of unleavened bread that's broken. It's a small amount of fruit juice. Almost all of us could afford that. Right? But here he's saying, hey, if we're having a potluck and you make food and you set it in there and somebody else eats your food, don't be rude to them. Don't shame them. But the flip side of that coin, what he's saying here is, don't go in there and eat your food in front of them. Oh, yeah, we, boy, we brought steak today. What do you have? Nothing? Huh. <laughs> Tough to be you, huh? Right? You, it shouldn't be that way. We should be loving toward one another. We should help each other. And that sort of that's what was happening, and they were calling it communion. Well, this is the Lord's Supper, and I brought steak. Oh, he brought lamb. You brought nothing? Well, I guess you're not having communion today, are you? Think about how puffed up and how pride. I mean, this church in Corinth, they had a lot of problems. They, had, they were in the flesh. They didn't know all these things. They, these things had to be set in order and corrected. Look at, look at 22. He says, what, have you not houses to eat and drink in? Or despise ye the church of God, and shame them that have not. What shall I say unto you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. He said, look, food time is not the Lord's table. Potluck time is not the Lord's supper. And then he, so immediately he reminds them what the Lord's supper is. Verse 23. 
for I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. So there was significance. There was a memorial. I want you to turn back to chapter uh, Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12. So again, the potluck is not the Lord's Supper. And he's warning them about that. You're eating and you're, you're full and the other guy is starving and you're calling it the Lord's Supper to where then that guy doesn't even get to participate. It's not right. We should not do that in church. And hey, thank God we have the facility and the opportunity to fellowship around food here. But let's never be rude about it. Let's never be rude to, to a stranger. You ought to, you ought to go hungry and feed your brother if it comes down to it. You ought to feed a stranger, a visitor, and if they walk in there and take your food, and that was you had been looking forward to it, and you hadn't eaten breakfast, you know what your attitude ought to be? Well, praise the Lord, I could be a blessing to them instead of puffed up over what you had and shame them for not having. Potluck is not the Lord's Supper. You're in Exodus chapter 12. Look at verse 14. And this day shall be unto you for a memorial. Right? So when he said, this do in remembrance of me, he said in 1 Corinthians 11. That's what we see in Luke chapter 22. We also see it in Mark chapter 14. We see it in Matthew chapter, what is it, 26. We see it in John chapter 13 that Jesus is reminding them, I have a desire to eat this. I want you to remember me. This do in remembrance of me. Why? It goes all the way back to when he delivered them. Right? What did he say there? Do it for a memorial. And ye shall keep it a feast unto the Lord throughout your generations, right? Until the, until the Lord returns. And ye shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. Look at verse 17. And ye shall observe the feast of unleavened bread. For in this selfsame day have I brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. Therefore shall ye observe this day in your generations by an ordinance forever. Hey, he set it in order. It's something that we keep. Jump ahead to verse 33. 33. And the Egyptians were urgent upon the people that they might send them out of the land in haste. For they said, We be all dead men. And the people took their dough before it was leavened, their kneading troughs being bound up in their clothes upon their shoulders. What's he saying? Right? The Egyptians are coming after them. They're getting out of there in haste. They're hurrying. So they had kept the Passover lamb. Hey, Christ was our Passover. But yet he says, keep the feast. Right? In sincerity and truth, it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Right? That's what we're memorizing as a church right now. Why? So we remember, hey, we keep the feast in sincerity. Christ was the Passover. Now we're going to get the leaven out of our life. Jump ahead to 37. And the children of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Succoth, about 600,000 on foot that were men besides children. 600,000 men, not counting the children. Think about it. Now, if we, if we did an average in here and we just counted the men, that might be about half of our population. Right? There's a lot of children in here, but there are also single guys and smaller families, right? So 600,000 men, I believe, would equate to well over a million people. So here's the congregation making haste. They're leaving in a hurry. They've already kept the Passover at home by their family, one lamb per family, right? Salvation is an individual thing right? You got saved on your own belief. You got saved by what you believe and receive in your own heart. I can't get saved for you. Just because you go to this church doesn't make you saved. But now as a church, because we are all saved, we profess the Lord Jesus Christ, we're going to follow this picture here where the entire congregation is out together. Over a million people here. He says, verse 38, And a mixed multitude went up also with them, and flocks and herds, even much cattle. And they baked unleavened cakes of the dough, which they brought forth out of Egypt. For it was not leavened, because they were thrust out of Egypt and could not tarry. Neither had they prepared for themselves any victual. Go back to 1 Corinthians 11. So even in the Old Testament, the picture was the congregation kept the feast of unleavened bread. And yet the individuals, the families kept 
the Passover. And so there are people today that would point and say, well, I think we should just do the Lord's Supper at home in our own time, and we don't need to worry about examining ourselves. We can do it whenever we want. We can get around to it. Well, the problem with that is it just doesn't happen, right? Churches that don't keep the ordinance, guess what? The people aren't doing it. They're not keeping it at home. So that's why as a church we keep it as a reminder. We're obeying that commandment. So once a year somebody will remind you, hey, guess what? That Those thoughts you're having, that sin you're dealing with, you need to get serious about it. You need to trust the Lord that He can help you overcome it and give it to the Lord. Confess it to the Lord. Try to forsake your sin. Follow the Lord. Get closer to Him in your life. And we're going to do it as a congregation. It doesn't mean we confess our sins together. Hey, we're just going to keep the solemn feast and remember what the Lord has forgiven us of. You're in 1 Corinthians 11. Look at verse 33. Wherefore, my brother, my brethren, when you come together to eat, tarry one for another. Tarry means take your time, be slow, be patient. In, in application, it's saying help one another. Be giving to one another. You know, we had a family last year that came to the church, and they were hungry. And, you know, the, in that other building, all the crockpots were lined up in the back. That family would show up late occasionally, and they showed up late. And everybody had brought food that day. And they don't know the operation. They're not, they're not close members, but they were people that were visiting and growing and learning. They were saved. And you know what they did? As soon as church was over, they went over to those crockpots. Each crockpot was an individual family's food for the day. And they helped themselves to whatever they wanted. Hey, praise the Lord, we were able to feed them. Right? Some people got real offended. Other families just said, eh, it's okay. We'll get pizza. And that's what we did as a church. All right? Hey, we'll, we'll, we'll get pizza. And we'll feed everybody. Because you know what? They were hungry. Can you imagine shaming them? Everybody brought food today. Oh, what? that's my food. You give that back. Put that down. My wife cooked that for me. We're not allowed to eat that. We all come together. We should tarry one for another. You know, and that's what was happening here in 1 Corinthians is they were being rude to each other. They weren't willing to share. You know, and in the flesh, we love food, right? Hey, we're commanded to fast. That's an important thing. You know, when's the last time you fasted? When's the last time you were able to go without food? All the more to give somebody else some food. You know, and you think about that. You think about that operation there, that that family was hungry, and it was a blessing that I can say of our church, we fed them. And there were some people that got offended. That was my food. I cooked this special dish. Well, look, I'm going to buy you pizza or whatever. What would we, we get? Firehouse subs, whatever it was. The church paid for it, and we made sure everybody ate that day. But you know what? Hey, if, if they ate some of your food, some of y'all that were there, praise the Lord. They, you fed them. You fed them. Don't have a hard heart about that. And if the same thing happens again, if we have visitors in here and they go into our fellowship hall and they just take whatever they want, go ahead and send them home with some seconds. Right? Hey, why don't you take some home for somebody else? Lord be with you. Lord bless you. Don't shame them because they don't have food. Look at verse 34. And if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that he come not together unto condemnation. And the rest will I set in order when I come. If the food becomes such a problem for you in the congregation, then why don't you just eat at home so you're not hungry or in the flesh here in church? And then being condemned of God, being judged of God because you're not tearing one for another. We need to be patient for each other. We need to love each other. And that's what it's talking about as, as far as the eating at home. And that's the application of it here. And I know that people misuse that. We've got one last question. It's how. How is communion kept? And it's a solemn feast, right? It's, it means serious. It's a serious time of the year. It's orderly. Things have an order. Right? It's after examining yourself. Remember in Exodus when he said that all the congregation should keep it. Right? No uncircumcised person. You shouldn't be unsaved. Look at verse 27 in this chapter. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 27. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. So who is unworthy? Well, that's the saved, not examining themselves. Hey, that's also the unsaved, that they don't care about the body of Christ. They don't care what Christ did for them. They're just going to, I want everybody to see that I'm, I'm one of them, right? Be careful. Look what he says in verse 29. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. 
For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. Go to Numbers chapter 9 and we'll be done here. Numbers chapter 9. So listen, it's that time of year. Take it seriously. Be willing to purge yourself. Be willing to ask the Lord, Lord, show me my secret faults. Show me the sins that I'm overlooking. Show me the things that I need to fix so I can be used of you more. It's not something you need to avoid. It's not something you should skip. You need to obey God's commandment to do it. And you need to remember it. You need to keep it with us and do it for God's glory. Don't do it to be seen of men. Do it so that you understand that God said, hey, look, I died for all your sins. Once a year, I want you to come together and remember what I've forgiven you of. You know, last year we had an Andersonite that refused to obey it. And he couldn't give me any scripture. Well, you know, I just think I should do it at home. And I said, well, why? Where in the Bible can you show me where it says that? Because look, Christ was our Passover. That was at home. What scripture do you use? Well, I don't have any scripture. I just feel that we should do it at home. Listen, that, that Andersonite response of, I'm just going to follow what the man said. Hey, I follow Paul as long as he follows Christ. Right? You know what I'm saying? Hey, you can follow Anderson, but when he stops following Christ, stop following him. Right. I don't care if he's right on salvation. If he's wrong on communion, don't follow him in that because you won't be blessed. Amen. God does this so that we will be blessed, especially as a congregation. But if you want to be blessed as an individual, you should not skip it. You should not avoid it. You should not rebel against what the Bible says. Well, I don't understand it. I just know that who I follow doesn't do this, so I'm following him. Well, you're following the wrong person. You're, you're, you're skipping it for the wrong reason. Right? The Bible gave a time and a reason to skip it. We're going to look at that right now. Numbers chapter 9, verse number 10. Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If any man of you, of your posterity, shall be unclean by reason of a dead body, or be in a journey afar off, yet he shall keep the Passover unto the Lord. The fourteenth day of the second month at even shall he keep it and eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Right? How are we going to do it? We're going to put bitter herbs in the unleavened bread. Now here, if you miss it, I will make provision for you a month later. I will help you out. A month later, we will take care of it. We will make sure that you have that opportunity. Right? So that is the purpose. You know, that, hey, if you say, look, there's something I'm dealing with. I can't talk about it. Can I do it a month from now? No questions asked. Yes. I'll make provision. The Bible tells us to. Be, be merciful. Be long-suffering as Christ was. But look what he says. Continuing on. Look at verse 12. They shall leave none of it until the morning, nor break any bone of it, according to all the ordinances of the Passover. They, sh they shall keep it. What he's saying is, back in Exodus 12, it said, hey, don't break any bones. Sound familiar? The Lord Jesus Christ. This is the memorial. We remember what he did for us. He died for us. But notice, first they roasted it, then they burnt what was left, right? Jesus died in hell for your sins. That was a picture of what Christ did. Look at verse 13. But the man that is clean and is not in a journey and forbeareth to keep the Passover, even the same soul shall be cut off from among his people, because he brought not the offering of the Lord in his appointed season, that man shall bear his sin. So if you're clean, if there's no reason you should miss it, and you decide to skip the Lord's table to avoid communion, he's saying you're going to bear your sin. That's a presumptuous sin. To him to know it do good and do it not, to him it is sin, right? The Bible says we should remember this once a year. We should take a time to get serious. And look, don't, don't say, well, I can't get perfect. Hey, amen, none of us can. But you need to talk to the Lord. You need to, you need to, you need to talk, you need to confess to him. You need to deal with what you're dealing with and help the Lord you know, be able to use you by sacrificing your own desire. Right? We should die daily to Christ. And here he's saying once a year, let's get real serious about this. Let's take a time. Don't skip it. Don't avoid it. If you're clean, you don't have a reason why you need to, to wait a month. Don't wait a month. Just do it. The who? Every Christian. Not the unworthy. The what? Unleavened bread. Broken. Unfermented wine. Not alcoholic. The when? Right before Easter. Right? We make provision. We're giving you warning in advance. Right? So we will do it where? At church. Not at home. 
We do it at church as a congregation. How? We do it as a solemn feast. We do it orderly. We do it after examining ourselves. So what's communion for? To give God the glory in your life. It's your personal opportunity this time of year just to say, Lord, let me lay everything else aside and focus on you. And listen, there are a lot of you that, are, that have, hey man, I'm making great spiritual growth personally and my family's moving forward and, and I really even feel the same way in a lot of things. And yet there are things that we all need to just, okay, Lord, what else? What else do you want me to do? I'll do it. I want to be used of you more and more and more. And that's the purpose of communion. So let's have a good heart about it. Let's obey the Lord in this commandment. Let's not avoid it. Let's not try to, you know, take some strange Catholic perspective of things, or let's not, you know, take some strange Andersonite view of things, right? Which, when, when Anderson, I mean, when he, when he brags about being the only person in the world that sees it this way, guess what? That's wrong. That's wrong. That's a little weird, okay? When you start, I'm the only one that sees it this way. I came up with this doctrine. Okay, we call that strange doctrine. There must be heresies among us to show what is approved. There is a time and a purpose. And listen, because of what the Catholics do, I can understand why people have a knee-jerk reaction away from Catholicism. Well, I don't want to do what they're doing. Hey, amen. What they're doing is heretical. It's heresy. They're trying to sacrifice God over and over and over as if His one sacrifice was insufficient. So again, don't overcorrect and end up in the ditch. If you go to too far to the left or the right, you're in the ditch. And communion is one of those things that's just like that, right? Don't avoid it. Don't do it at home. Don't follow what the Catholics do. Let's do what God said. And it's very simple. It's very easy. But it's that time of the year for you to examine yourself and get